Welcome and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending our webinar today. Um, I just want to have give you a few reminders, just letting you know that all attendees are in listen only mode for the duration of the webinar. However, we do welcome your questions. Please use the question box to type your questions in. And our experts from the Department of Public Health will be addressing those questions during the session. Just as a reminder, the session is being recorded and it will be posted to the CSDE's COVID-19 webpage. I'd like to turn it over to John Frasinelli from the Connecticut State Department of Education. John. Great, thank you, Michelle, and welcome everyone. Um, I'm John Frasinelli, I'm Director of, of School Health, Nutrition and Family Services at the State Department of Education. Uh, thank you so much for being on. Uh, we have a, a nice large crowd today of over 400 folks. Um, and so on behalf of Commissioner Cardona and Deputy Commissioner Charlene Russell Tucker, uh, thank you for contributing, for continuing to participate in our in these webinars. And I also wanna thank all of our uh, partners at uh, the State Department of Public Health, who uh, many of you have seen on previous webinars, but we have some new faces today uh, to greet you and provide you with some critical information. So uh, as is, uh, customary on these, we will. There will be presentations from our, our guest panelists, and then um, Chris Soto from the Department of Education, my colleague, um, will uh, take over and pull questions out of uh, the chat. So, if you have questions, please put them in the question box um, in the webinar, and and Chris will ask them of our panelists after the presentation. So, uh, without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Lori Matthew, the branch chief at the Department of Public Health. John, thank you very much. And John, uh, we want to thank you on behalf of Commissioner Adirja Gifford and Deputy Commissioner Heather Aaron of the Department of Public Health and this partnership. Um, and I want to thank uh, specifically Commissioner Cardona and uh, Deputy Commissioner Charlene Russell Tucker for all of the good work in working uh, closely with us um, as school reopening for K through 12 uh, continues to move forward. Um, today, and, and on behalf of the Department of Public Health, there are a number of uh, department um, experts. Uh, Kristen Soto will be presenting directly, but I wanna have the department staff uh, introduce themselves uh, that are on the call. Uh, that are on this webinar. So we'll start with uh, Lynn Sosa. Lynn, if you could introduce yourself and then the rest of the DPH staff introduce yourself. Yep, thanks, Lori. So I'm Dr. Lynn Sosa. I, I, many of you have probably seen me before and I'm the Deputy State Epidemiologist at the Department of Public Health. Let's go to Tom. Hi, uh, a lot of you have seen me before. I'm Tom St. Louis. Uh, I'm with the Environmental and Occupational Health Assessment Program um, at DPH, and I'm happy to be here on this webinar again. Great. Thank you, Tom. Kristen Soto. Chris. Hi, I'm Kristen Soto. I'm an epidemiologist at the Connecticut Department of Public Health in the Infectious Disease Section. I was responsible for implementation of our contact tracing system and for designing the processes around our contact tracing. Excellent, Kristen. And Kristen Gerard. Hi, I'm Kristen Gerard. I am also an epidemiologist in the infectious diseases section in the immunization program. I am the vaccine preventable disease surveillance coordinator and work closely with Kristen Soto on our contact tracing programs. Excellent. Is there anyone else on from the State Department of Public Health that I don't see <laughs> your videos? Thank you. Okay, so with that, I know that. Um, uh, there's there's over 300 people on this, so we really welcome all of your um, being on the webinar and participating and listening to our experts. So, John, I'll turn it back to you. Okay, uh, I also want to um, introduce Russell Melmed. Russell, if you want to introduce yourself. Uh, sure, uh, Russell Melmed. I'm the Director of Health for Chatham Health District, which is centered in the town of East Hampton, uh, and I'm, uh, I'm not a PH employee, but here to maybe provide a little bit of a local perspective from a local health department perspective. Terrific, appreciate you being here. And with that, Kristen, I'll turn it over to you, Kristen Soto. Yes, thank you so much. Um, and thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak to all of the schools today about recommendations for contact tracing um, in the schools, particularly in grades K through 12. Um, next slide, please. 
So to be clear, we do not expect anybody at any school to become master contact tracers overnight, but we know that understanding um, how COVID-19 is going to impact your school year and especially how either cases or people exposed to COVID-19 in your schools is going to implement a lot of your policies and decisions, we did want to take this opportunity to review a few things with you today. So we wanted to help you to understand what contact tracing is in general and how that's being implemented here in Connecticut. We wanted to help you understand your specific roles and responsibilities um, and how those roles and responsibilities are being shared with um, the State Department of Education, um, your local health departments, as well as the Department of Public Health. We wanted you to understand what will trigger a contact tracing um, investigation in your school setting. We wanted to help you understand what information needs to be collected to successfully do contact tracing so that if this does occur in your school, you're not unclear of how to proceed or what information might be needed. And then lastly, unfortunately with COVID, there tend not to be very many black and white answers where we can say, if this happens, you must do this. There are a lot of gray areas. And so we really want to help you understand some of the decision-making around contact tracing so that you, along with your local health department, can be empowered to make the decisions that are most important for your school community. Next slide, please. So to get started, I just wanted to level set everybody's understanding by reviewing a few definitions. Next slide, next slide, please. So I know earlier in the week, many of you reviewed a table about how you would deal with children or with staff with illnesses in your school setting. When we talk about contact tracing, there are really two types of people that we're concerned about, cases and contacts. And both of these um, groups of individuals have very specific definitions. So a case is an individual who tests positive for the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is the virus that is responsible for COVID-19. And that test must either be a positive PCR test or a positive antigen test to be considered a case um, that requires contact tracing and for which we would be making public health recommendations. Next slide, please. A contact, on the other hand, is a person who has an exposure to a case while that case is infectious, meaning when they're capable of transmitting their infection to others. So that can occur in sort of one or two ways. So the first is direct exposure. So for example, if somebody sneezes directly in someone else's face, you should consider them exposed regardless of how much time they spend around each other. The second scenario is a little bit more nuanced, and that is people who spend a prolonged period of time within close contact of each other. In order to operationalize that, we have defined that as individuals who spend 15 minutes or more within six feet of one another. And a lot of contact tracing really comes down to evaluating who is a case and who is a contact and what needs to be done with each of these groups of people. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So the next thing that we're going to really be talking about is how contact tracing works specifically here in Connecticut. So as I mentioned before, contact tracing will start with the identification of a case. So that involves a person going to a laboratory or a doctor's office or a drive through testing center, getting tested for COVID and having that test come back as a positive result. Next slide, please. Once that result is reported, there are multiple things that happen. So the first is the person's medical provider should be getting back the results and informing their patient that they have tested positive. The second is that that case needs to be reported to local health authorities. Um, so typically this will be reported to the state and local health department via either an electronic or a paper report, and we would receive that information. Sometimes there can be a delay in that process, and so the first report of a case might be coming into your school when a parent picks up the phone, calls you and says, um, 
my child has tested positive for COVID or if a staff member calls out and lets you know that they have tested positive. Next slide, please. Once we have identified an individual who has tested positive, the first thing that we do is we interview that individual. We make sure that they are aware of their positive test result. We let them know the public health recommendations that they need to self-isolate at home, meaning that for the window during which they're infectious and could spread their illness to others, they should be staying home and they should be staying away from other people to prevent that from happening. And then we also ask them who they were around while they were infectious. And as part of this interview process, we ask them three things. We say, who are the specific people that you had close contact with? What are the locations, including schools, that you would have spent time in? And were there any large events or other gatherings that you went to during this window? Next slide, please. Once the case identifies the contacts, or the people who they have um, spent prolonged periods of time with or had other direct exposure, we would then reach out to each of those contacts, let them know about their exposure, and, and advise them that they should self-quarantine at home for a period of 14 days. Um, in the normal contact tracing process, this is all occurring within our contact tracing pool, either at the state health department or at the local health department level. Um, but as we start to move into the school year, this is a process where schools will need to have some involvement, particularly for exposures that are happening in a classroom setting. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, we are doing contact tracing statewide. That is currently being done using a statewide software system called Contact. This is jointly being used both by um, the state health department as well as all of the local health departments in the state. Um, local health departments are responsible for residents of their jurisdiction um, and the state is supporting them in those efforts both by providing the software for this work um, as well as by standing up a pool of volunteer contact tracers to help um, meet local needs. We are not asking anyone from schools to directly sign up to use the contact system. This is a tool that is available for your local health departments to use if it is helpful for them in managing school-based exposures. And we would strongly encourage you to start talking to your um, local health departments as soon as possible to make sure that you have a plan in place for how contact tracing will occur at your local level and what information would need to be shared if cases occur in your school. The other thing to point out is that although our contact tracers are not necessarily conducting school-based investigations, we do interview all individuals who are Connecticut residents that test positive for COVID. That means that we would be interviewing individuals who might be staff or teachers in your school, and that we would be interviewing school-aged children um, via their parents or guardians. As part of this investigation, we will be asking people again about the individuals they spend time with, the locations that they went, including the schools, um, and what large events they may have gone to. If a child is identified as attending school, we will ask them what school they attend, and this information will be made available to your local health department via the contact application. Additionally, we realize that while schools are an important location where exposures might occur to people who are positive for COVID, there are also other places um, where these exposures might occur. So students, teachers, and staff might be identified as contacts and asked to self-quarantine, even if you do not have any cases that occur in your school. Next slide, please. So there are many scenarios, as I described, where an individual might be asked to quarantine. Basically, we're looking for any individual who has had contact with a known case, and these can be identified in many ways. So as described on the previous slide, we may learn about individuals who need to quarantine via our contact tracing using our contact system. Individuals may also be identified via a school investigation if there is a positive case in a school. If there is a positive case in a healthcare setting and individuals are exposed, they would also be advised to self-quarantine. 
And Connecticut still has um, a travel advisory where individuals who travel to high-risk states are um, requested to self-quarantine for 14 days upon their return. Um, it's important to understand that all of these individuals in any of these scenarios would be asked to self-quarantine for 14 days and they cannot return to school during this window. Um, individuals who are asked to self-quarantine should really be staying away from others as much as possible, not only in the community, but also in their own households, staying in a separate bedroom and bathroom whenever possible. Um, one thing for schools to be aware of is that individuals who are asked to self-quarantine may not always have documentation to this effect and may be given verbal requests um, to self-quarantine. So that is something to be aware of as you are talking to both parents or your staff and teachers over the phone if they do call out um, alerting you that they have been advised to self-quarantine by a public health authority. Next slide, please. So for the next several slides, I'm going to start talking about um, the specific considerations around contact tracing in a school setting and then also get into some specific scenarios that we know have historically arisen when we've done contact tracing in schools um, for other diseases such as mumps or measles where we've worked with many of you in the past. Next slide. So the first and most important thing is to not panic. I know that if you guys get a call either from somebody who calls with a parent saying their child's tested positive or if you get a call from a public health department it can be really scary and you start thinking of all of the things that need to be done immediately. Um, we would definitely encourage you to take care of any immediate health needs right away. So if you find out that there is an individual in your school who now has a positive result, that would mean safely um, self-isolating them until they can be picked up and dismissed from school. But most other things can wait until you sort of take a deep breath and look at the information in front of you. There are several things that you can do in advance to make this um, much easier for you in the long run. So the first is having a plan in place. Um, as part of that plan, knowing exactly what you will do if you have a positive case, um, that includes having templates ready. So it's something that if you have a positive case or people with exposures, you're able to just quickly update that and send that out, as well as most importantly, knowing who to call. Um, there's sort of, a saying in public health preparedness that you should never be meeting your neighbor during an emergency. Um, so we would definitely encourage you to know who your contacts are at your local health department and for local health departments, knowing who your contacts are in the school and understanding if you do get a call saying, you know, there's a case in this school, exactly who needs to be called to start the investigation and start making decisions about how to proceed. Um, but again, the most important thing is to make sure that you sort of take a deep breath, think about what needs to be done, um, and regroup with your team before starting to take any type of action, aside from meeting the immediate health needs of individuals who might be impacted. Next slide, please. The other thing to keep in mind is that schools have done a really good job of identifying mitigation strategies or things that can be put in place to minimize the risk of transmission. While these do not eliminate the need to exclude individuals who have had an exposure, they do put in an immediate level of protection to help stop um, the immediate risk of transmission, as well as give us some time to figure out what appropriate control measures might be when that initial call comes in. So some examples of this are making sure that individuals are wearing face coverings, um, are working or um, studying in areas of adequate ventilation and that hand washing is being encouraged. We know that schools are stepping up um, cleaning and disinfection of high touch surfaces to um, reduce transmission from touching surfaces and then people touching their face or mucous membranes. We know that you've worked really hard to try to social distance people as much as possible. So keeping all staff and students six feet apart from each other whenever possible. We know that there have been a lot of changes in general to the way that schools do business on a daily basis to make things safer for their communities. And we also know that some school districts are employing cohorting. So certain students will show up certain days of the week or certain classrooms will stay together and not mix with the general student population. And all of these strategies will help to minimize the risk of transmission 
um, and hopefully keep the need for some of the additional um, more stringent control measures to a minimum. Next slide, please. So whenever I talk about contact tracing, my favorite thing to show are calendars such as these. Um, epidemiologist, if I get a phone call that somebody has tested positive for any disease, the first thing I do is I print out my calendar and try to figure out what we're actually dealing with. So in the scenario that's shown here, hypothetically, let's say you were called on Monday the 9th by a parent letting you know that their child has tested positive for COVID. Unfortunately for you, um, when talking to the parent, you learn that they actually became sick on Friday night and that they were in school on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Since an individual is considered infectious for two days before their symptom onset until at least 10 days afterwards, that means that you would want to look at that student's movement on Wednesday the 4th, Thursday the 5th, and Friday the 6th because those are the three days that um, exposures could have potentially occurred in your classroom um, or in other settings in your school. Next slide, please. On the other hand, looking at this scenario, the school receives a call on Tuesday the 10th. This individual started feeling sick on Monday morning, and so their parents kept them home from school. Looking at the two days before their symptom onset, that was a Saturday and a Sunday. So although this individual cannot return to school and must stay out for at least 10 days after their symptom onset, there were no exposures that need to be assessed in the school setting. So the first thing that anybody would need to do if they receive a call is start to evaluate what days are of interest and are there actually public health recommendations that are needed. Again, this is not something that we would expect a school to do independently. And if you do receive notification of a positive case, we would encourage you to reach out to your local health department to assist in this process. Next slide, please. One thing that schools really do excel at um, that local health may not have as much insight to though, is understanding what students do once they're inside your building. So once a day is identified, um, again, you would work with your local health department to figure out what specific exposures have occurred. So for example, what was going on in the student's classroom? Where does the student eat lunch? Do they take part in sport or any extracurricular activities? Um, do they ride the school bus or do they get dropped off to go to school? Um, do they socialize with other kids um, like while waiting at the bus stop or on breaks or at recess? Um, so really getting that insight into what the normal movements of a student and specifically the student who tested positive looks like is something where schools will really have the expertise to understand what is going on. Um, and I understand that you guys have also done a ton of work making sure that each of these environments minimizes the risk of transmission as much as feasible. So again, working in partnership with your local health department you would be able to start to build a list of both the days where exposures may have occurred, as well as the specific types of school-related exposures that warrant additional investigation. Next slide. So as you start to move from days to specific types of exposures, the last step in identifying exposed individuals is actually trying to get down to the individual level if possible. So looking again at the big picture from going from what day a student is there to what specific exposures occurred on those days, trying to decide were there really a limited number of exposures that occurred in a single classroom on a single school bus, or were these really more widespread throughout the school community? Were appropriate control measures in place to mitigate exposure in these settings? So for example, we know that with young children like kindergartners, they may not be very good at social distancing, even if you do have controls in place to try to attempt that. Whereas for older students, if you have their desks six feet apart and tell them to stay there, there might be a better chance that they do. Um, so really looking at the individual behaviors in your schools and in your settings, as well as what the students tell you as part of their experience will really help you to understand 
whether or not effective control measures were put in place to eliminate the risk of transmission or not. And then lastly, once you look at the sum of what happened for that case's activities, is it feasible or is it possible to identify specific individuals who are exposed, or do you really need to look at larger exclusions, such as for an entire classroom, an entire school bus, or even an entire school? Again, um, we would not expect any school or local health department to make these recommendations on their own, but really working in partnership to balance um, the understanding of what's happening in the school setting um, with the science and public health recommendations. Next slide. The last thing, and really the most important thing, which is why we've put this last, even though it should occur first, is communication. So we know that if there is a case of COVID in your school, there are going to be numerous individuals who need to be looped in. So we would recommend that you notify your local health department as soon as possible. Um, you guys will be partners as part of this process um, between both the schools and the local health departments in order to evaluate the situation, determine what public health measures are appropriate and implement any control measures that are needed. So the sooner that you start this conversation, the more smoothly this entire process will go. Secondly, we know that in each school and in each school system, there is a chain of command. So for example, in the past when we've worked with school nurses, we know that they need to notify their principals who in turn need to notify their superintendents. So deciding um, in advance of a situation, but especially during um, a contact tracing investigation, who is the point of contact for talking to individuals within and outside of your organization um, and making sure that everybody who needs to know knows at the appropriate time is a really important activity. We know that sending messaging out to parents and staff is another key activity that needs to occur. Um, working with your local health department, you'll be able to update any templates that need to be sent out um, regarding a specific situation in your school and decide what messaging is appropriate at what time. Again, we would recommend that you do not send any information out to parents until you speak with your local health department um, to make sure that the information going out is accurate as well as appropriate for the current situation that you're dealing with. And then the last um, situation is unfortunately public communication. Um, so we found in the past that when schools do send out letters, either school-wide or district-wide, um, they may be picked up by the media and generate inquiries. Um, so that is something that you should be prepared to deal with. And again, your local health department and the state health department can help you with that. Um, but it is something that you should be aware of um, that might be another factor that you have to deal with and consider who is appropriate to respond to these types of inquiries from the public or from media outlets. Next slide. Next slide, please. So for the last bit, I just wanted to talk through a couple of scenarios um, that we know have come up historically when dealing with contact tracing investigations. So as I mentioned before, ideally the health department will always be the first group to know about a case of COVID. We would be able to give you warning that we've received this information, that it's been validated, and that we've assessed the exposure. However, we know in reality that you might be receiving calls from your staff or from your parents. Um, the most important first step is to confirm the diagnosis. And again, that's something that your local health department can help you to do. Um, but it is important to collect the minimum information to make that early investigation successful. So understanding who the person is, we would need to know their name, their date of birth, the date that they first had their symptom onset. And then we would also want to know if laboratory testing was done. If the parent is able to send you a copy of a lab result, that's great. Um, but if they've only heard verbally over the phone, then it's important to know when the specimen was collected, where they went to have that specimen collected, and who ordered the test in order to ensure that the person has actually tested positive for COVID either by an antigen or PCR test before implementing any type of public health control measures. The other important information is knowing when the student was in school so that we can determine 
even if this individual tests positive, if any control measures are needed in the school. And then again, once this information is collected and you get off the phone with either your staff or with your parent that you're speaking with, notifying your local health department so that they can help you research and evaluate this information. Next slide, please. The other question that I think we get asked more than any other when dealing with schools is what I like to call the sibling dilemma. So oftentimes there might be advice given to send an individual home from school because they've had an exposure, but then the question arises, do we need to pull their siblings out of school too? What should we be doing with those individuals? So if a child is sick, but has not been diagnosed with COVID, their siblings can remain in school. If an individual is determined to be a case, their siblings will be household contacts. They will have had um, exposure to their siblings while they were infectious, and they will need to self-quarantine for 14 days after their last known exposure, um, just like anybody who would have had an exposure in a school or in another setting. However, if the student in question is a contact, their siblings would not need to be excluded from school unless they also had direct contact with a case. Um, and that brings us to our next point on the next slide, which is that a contact of a contact is not the same thing as a contact. So if an individual is a case, the guidance is for them to self-isolate until they're no longer infectious. If an individual is a contact, they must self-quarantine for 14 days after their last known exposure. If an individual is a contact of a contact, meaning that they only came into contact with another contact and not a person who was infectious with COVID, there are no public health recommendations for that individual. Of course, we would recommend that as part of the contact self-quarantining, they stop potentially exposing that individual in case they themselves become sick. But again, there is nothing that a contact of a contact would need to do just because they came into contact with someone who has had an exposure. Next slide, please. And then the last and probably the heaviest question on most people's minds is should we shut down our schools? Um, school closures may occur into the fall on a case-by-case -case basis. And this would occur in consultation with your local health department. So if you are thinking about making any type of exclusions or closing down your school, we would definitely recommend talking to your local health department first. Um, typically, we recommend using the least restrictive interventions possible. So if you're able to exclude individuals, that would be the first choice. If you're able to exclude individual classrooms or an individual school bus, that would be the next best thing. And closing schools is typically reserved as a last resort if neither of those interventions would be effective. Additionally, there might be additional statewide or localized recommendations based on community transmission that we would um, ask you to heed as the guidance might change over time. And if you find out that there is widespread transmission in your local school, it might require your school to close for a certain amount of time to control that localized outbreak. Again, we would not recommend that you take any of these actions unless you talk to your local health department first and then working together, you would be able to come up with the best strategy based on the scenario that is currently in front of you. Additionally, um, schools may opt to close if they need some time to figure out what is going on and investigate any cases in their school and determine exposures. So for example, if you learn about a case at the end of the day on a Monday, you may opt to close for a day or two to figure out what is going on, who was exposed, and if it is possible to safely reopen or if you need to keep the rest of your school closed. Again, um, this is something that should be done in consultation with your local health department as part of your investigation. Um, and then the last scenario that might arise is if there is a high level of absenteeism. So if there are a large number of cases or your contacts in a school, there may not be a public health recommendation to close, but you may decide for other reasons that it's infeasible to keep in-person learning going either permanently or for a limited duration of time. 
And again, those are um, discussions that you can have both with your local health department, um, as well as with the State Department of Education in terms of the best way to proceed if that situation arises. Next slide, please. Um, and so now I'd like to turn it over to Russell Melmed, who's the Director of Health for the Chatham Health District, um, to give a local health perspective on how he is approaching this in his communities. Thanks, Kristen. Uh, that was uh, incredibly thorough. You, you stole a bunch of the points I was going to make, so uh, I'm going to keep my remarks brief. That really was a great, uh, great summary of what to expect. Um, and, you know, as I was listening to you talk, Kristen, it, it just, I think it served to underscore one, one of my first points, and that is, um, Kristen mentioned that she didn't expect and we don't expect uh, school officials to be expert contact tracers. I want to I want to say that um, when you're talking to your local health department, if, if you have a case, um, if there's something that requires you to think about um, triggering contact tracing or you are in the thick of contact tracing, there is a lot of jargon that people in public health uh, throw around. And we've been living COVID-19 now for so many months. Um, it's all we talk about really in, in our in our offices with our colleagues. We don't see many other people, so use a lot of jargon. And uh, we've had a few what I'll call dry runs with a couple of schools in our in our jurisdiction. Thankfully, schools not been in session. Um, I found myself using a lot of jargon. And I want to emphasize this point to uh, school officials. When you hear your local health department officials using jargon that you don't fully understand, stop them right there. Ask them what they're talking about. Ask them to define what the term is they're using or ask them not to use it. Um, we just heard Kristen use a lot of jargon, um, things that I understand and most of my colleagues would in local health. Many of you probably uh, don't and may not remember one month, two months, three months down the road um, what these terms actually mean. So please, we're going on and on about things we're expecting of you during contact tracing uh, and we're using words that, that uh, you know, really are Again, jargon, stop us, um, because that will prevent any misunderstandings, uh, and it'll make sure that everybody's clear and understanding what everybody's role is, what everybody has to do. I can tell you from a recent history that, that it does make a difference um, if everybody understands language that everybody's using. Just as you know, in local health, we may not understand all the language that you're using to describe your school, your operations, your classroom. Um, uh, there are things that we don't understand about uh, about terminology uh, that's commonly used in your setting. So make sure you understand each other. I think that's that's one of the biggest things I can emphasize. Uh, so you mentioned a couple of things about sources of information. You may hear about a case from your local health department through these traditional surveillance, uh, uh, public health surveillance systems, and, and that's great, and that makes things, I think, a little bit easier. Um, it's fine when you hear from families themselves or from your employees about test results. That's that's uh, that's that's also good. But, um, but I'm going to use one other example, and it's come up recently, and it's probably happened to, to many of my local health colleagues. And those are our um, our partners out there in the community, or as I like to call them, public health vigilantes. Uh, these are people who hear about things in the community. They know somebody who knows somebody. Uh, who traveled somewhere, or they heard that somebody is sick and that their sibling uh, is in college where there was an outbreak. And any of you, many of our school colleagues will get those emails, they'll get those phone calls, um, text messages, however it happens, you'll see it on Facebook. Uh, and these claims um, can be alarming. Um, and uh, in my experience, most of the time, if not all of the time, um, if you follow up on them, you find that um, there really was no truth to the rumors, or it was that somebody was a contact of a contact, as Kristen said, and not actually the contact of a case or a case themselves. We've been finding that a lot in the local level. We are hearing from a lot of people. Everybody's been living COVID-19 for a long time now, and it, it's hard to escape it from your mind. So when you hear things, you think you need to tell an official because it sounds alarming. So you will hear about those things. And um, reach out to your local health department and determine if it's worth, you know, you will have to determine the credibility or the veracity of those claims. Um, but uh, but I wouldn't encourage you to necessarily 
uh, vigorously follow up on every single claim uh, from, from somebody in the community who knows somebody, again, who knows somebody uh, who is a case. Um, there are a lot of good methods. Our public health surveillance is very good at identifying cases. Um, and I think that most families and most of your staff as well, if they find out that they are a case or they're a contact of somebody who's a case, be open. We, we should be setting aside any stigma associated with COVID-19. And that should be the message, I think, locally to your staff um, and to the school community that there is no stigma associated with being exposed to COVID-19 or having COVID-19. The most important thing is that we um, understand quickly when we have a case and take the appropriate actions. Uh, the last thing I want to mention about your interactions uh, between school officials and local health departments, when you're in the thick of a uh, contact tracing investigation, there's going to be a lot of information that's going to be passed back and forth between local health and the schools. And so I think I'll emphasize again what Kristen said, knowing who to speak to and those chief points of contact, chains of communication are important. At the end of the day, um, your contact tracing effort may take more than a day. Uh, you may find out at the end of the day that something's going on. The investigation may span multiple uh, periods of time, multiple days. Get on that same page with your local health department. Um, uh, identify, make sure you go down and run a list of what you know at the end of that day. Names, classrooms, cohorts, um, dates, uh, who needs to quarantine, who's being recommended for testing, um, what your actions have to be at the school level and what the local health department is going to be doing in those intervening moments uh, between when you're talking. Make sure you're on that same page because, uh, you know, and to my local health colleagues, I've had this experience where I'm throwing out a lot of dates and times and names and jargon and um, a school official, if it's a superintendent or a principal, is doing a lot of head nodding and saying yes, 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 and an hour later having for the same conversation again because um, it wasn't clear. We used too much language. We felt too confident that what we were saying was perfectly clear and it wasn't. So before you start doing all your, uh, activating your different roles, and exercising your responsibilities and gathering information, and especially at the end of the day, make sure you are all on the same page, that you understand exactly who the contacts were that you know about, who you're still trying to find out about, what different settings that you're sure about, what you still don't understand, and who's gathering that information. Don't make assumptions. So, uh, because it's gonna be a very stressful moment. It's going to be painted with anxiety uh, and it is going to be driven um, by, uh, by hopefully not too much panic, but, but by a sense of urgency. You're going to want to get moving on this as fast as possible. But like Kristen said, take that moment, take a breath, make sure you understand exactly what you need to do um, because you don't really want to waste time, um, but you also um, don't want to make assumptions because those could be wrong. Um, We've had this experience in a couple of our schools already, again, not, not with school in session, thankfully, um, but they were good dry runs and they did teach us some important lessons about understanding roles and responsibilities, being clear, making sure everybody has all the information they need and that we understand each other. Because, uh, you know, maybe we've been working together on other things in past years, but they certainly haven't been things of this magnitude very often, uh, pandemic contact tracing. So, together, Take that breath, make sure everybody understands their roles and that you understand the language you're using um, and everything will be okay. Uh, we will, if we have confidence in the mitigation efforts that we are putting in place, that you're putting in place in schools and that we have confidence in our local health departments to understand them, that the measures that have to be taken and the recommendations, um, one case doesn't have to be multiple cases. It can just be one case. So um, I'll end my remarks with that, but uh, Thanks for your time. Kristen, I just want to make sure this is uh, Chris Soto here from Department of Education. Is there anybody else from DPH or are we going to questions? So there is nobody else presenting and our next slide basically just says questions and reiterates who's on the call from DPH and local health to answer those questions. Um, so we're prepared to um, field any questions that people might have now. Um, and before doing so, I just wanted to say that many of us at the Department of Public Health have school-aged children. And so 
we've seen firsthand like all of the amazing work that both our local health departments as well as the school systems are doing to allow schools to safely reopen and educate our children in the fall. And so we're really appreciative of that work and I'm happy to have this opportunity to work with you um, to make sure the contact tracing is implemented as um, efficiently as possible in these settings. Great, thank you. So, you know, the first thing I want to acknowledge is that it's 347 and we do have a lot of questions. Obviously this is a popular topic. We still have over 350 people on the line. And so if our colleagues from either, you know, our department or DPH can stay on as long as possible, um, that would be great, but understand that you might have some other time constraints and we can, you know, follow up, um, you know, via email with some of the questions that we don't get answered now. The second thing that I wanted to share was that um, for, for our participants, uh, please check out addendum number five. It's, uh, it was released in um, collaboration with our, the Department of Public Health and it answers some of the questions that we do have in the question box. Again, because we have a lot of questions, I wanna to get to some of the stuff that maybe hasn't been addressed before. But again, addendum five, um, ct.portal, uh, the SDE website, you can see that when it comes to scenarios, that, that, that um, addendum speaks specifically to scenarios. And then the last thing that I'll say before we get into the specific questions is that this PDF uh, slide deck is available. Um, if you look at the go to meeting kind of panel and interface, you should see the PDF there available. So I know some people had asked if this presentation was going to be available to them and you can kind of download it there. So I'm going to jump into our first question. And, um, you know, again, I'm going to try to group them as best as possible. Um, I think one of the main questions that has come up is if a student tests positive and students are in the classroom but they're six feet apart, does that count as exposure because they've been in the same classroom for the whole day? How would we approach that? So I think that, and this is something that um, Russ can definitely jump in as well on how he would handle this at the local level is I think that it's really going to depend on the scenario and how confident we are that individuals were able to actually social distance during that time. So if you know that people were of an age where you can trust that they're actually staying six feet apart from each other, if they say that they are, that they're consistently wearing masks, that there's good ventilation, and that you really have an understanding of how those individuals are mixing throughout the day and what their exposures are, then it might be appropriate to do exclusions on an individual by individual basis. We realize that that might not always be the case though, and that in some scenarios, either people may not be as vigilant about wearing their masks, especially if they're younger children. Um, you, it might not be understood how they're mixing throughout the day, especially for different activities or for recess for, or for things of that nature, in which case it might be more feasible to exclude an entire classroom. But again, that's something that your local health department can help you on um, that evaluation based on the specific scenario occurring in that specific classroom setting. Great, thank you. Um, so there was a there's a, a few questions around school closures, and um, you know the CDC guideline had talked about um, a certain period of time, whether it was you know a couple of days, two to five days. And so the questions have basically revolved around what is going to determine a specific school closure? Um, and if you could just kind of um, expound on that. Sure, so the two to five days was really designed to be an opportunity for schools to evaluate what is going on and implement public health control measures and not a mandate that they just close for any other reason. So if you are able to understand what is going on in a classroom and quickly identify individuals who are exposed and put in place all of the control measures that are needed, there is no requirement to close for two to five days. Um, and again, working with your local health department, you'll really be able to evaluate um, what days an affected individual was in school, um, where those specific exposures occurred in the school throughout the day, um, and then how quickly it is to enumerate um, who might have been exposed and implement any control measures that are needed. Um, so it's really something to help you in that process as opposed to a mandate that you must close for two to five days. 
Yeah. And Kristen, hi, everybody. I just want to add to that, that people need to take their specific situation into account. So many schools are going to be in a hybrid model. So it could be very possible that you're finding out about a student that tests positive whose um, cohort is not in school. So you kind of automatically have the opportunity to do the contact tracing and school doesn't have to close because the cohort you're most concerned about is actually not in school at that time. So it is really important to take into account the local circumstances and making those decisions. Great, thank you. Uh, the next kind of group of questions revolves around reporting and communication. And I know you spoke a little bit about uh, reporting in one of your slides, um, but you know the question specifically is around, um, you know, so for instance, in New York, an entire school would need to be notified if there's a positive case. Um, are, are there gonna be some standard practices with reporting um, here in Connecticut? So most of these decisions here in Connecticut are happening on the local level. We know from past experiences that there's always the balance between telling people who need to know because you're asking them to take specific action. So for example, you were exposed and you must quarantine versus um, not letting enough people know and then having rumors spin out of control. So again, I think your local health department would be the best ones to help you decide what that balance is. And Russ, do you have anything to add about how you would approach that in your school? Uh, yeah, I would, uh, you know, we sort of live in an era where information flies around fairly rapidly. And uh, frankly, I wouldn't be surprised if most people or many in the school community become aware of a situation before there's even an opportunity to send out official communication. So I would tend to, if especially if uh, it's a case that was infectious, in the school during the school day, um, if there were uh, the need to quarantine one or more other students for an investigation, make a general notification. That That's the most likely uh, recommendation I'll be making, but it is case by case, really. Um, it really is, but I think most of the time we will probably be recommending some kind of um, communication to the school community. Okay. Um, yeah, I, th I think that's very important, and I think that's something that we're seeing a lot in the questions, and what we've heard in the past is basically if, you know, should it be the group of students in that class, right, if there's a positive case that get communicated, or if it's the, sc the school, um, or the whole district, and so Cer I think... Certainly it would be a different type of communication, perhaps, that would go narrowly to the, uh, perhaps, students in the same classroom as the student, um, and certainly to the people who needed to quarantine, it may not be the same communication that everybody gets, but um, it would it would depend on the case. And then just um, kind of taking a step back before that, um, uh, a common question is basically, what is the family's responsibility to report a case? Um, so you know, basically, is 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 the primary care provider, you know, going to communicate or should communicate directly with the LH, the local health district, with the school, or if um, they're communicating directly with that family, you know, what's that family's responsibility to to communicate to the school community and who should they be talking to? So I don't, I don't know about oh, go ahead, Kristen, if you want. Okay, this gets into a little bit of a difficult situation. Um, we would definitely encourage you to discuss with your families what your school community's expectations are and letting both your students' parents as well as staff know that if they test positive or if they're asked to quarantine, that is information that you would like to know. Um, in some cases, um, astute clinicians might say, you know, I know I have this child who tested positive and they're in school and so I'm going to call the local health department, make sure they know this and can act upon it. In other circumstances, they really leave that up to the individual family um, to share that information and disclose it appropriately. So while we'll make every effort as public health professionals to get this information through our sort of standard reporting mechanisms, there is a certain amount of responsibility that will fall to the families themselves, even though it might not technically be legally required for them to do this um, as part of the understanding that this is what's expected of them as being part of your school community. Great, thank you. Um, one of the questions uh, is around the templates that was discussed in the presentation. 
And so are there standardized templates that school districts can use that we can um, push out to communities or are districts required to create them or the local health districts required to create them? So we are encouraging um, school districts to work with their local health departments on this messaging. And to Russ's previous point, um, there might be the need for multiple templates. So there might be one for you personally had an exposure and we're asking you to self quarantine for these 14 days versus, you know, we're aware of a case who was in school while infectious and we're just letting you know as an FYI because you might hear about it. Um, again, this really needs to be updated between the state, and, no, sorry, between the local health department and the school system to make sure that all of the appropriate contact information is there. We typically recommend that it goes out on the school's letterhead. Um, but we at the Department of Public Health can work on making a template available to local health departments to help um, inform those discussions. Um, so again, we would recommend that you work directly with your local health departments. And for local health directors on the call, we will be um, developing something to share with you um, if that would be helpful. Great. One quick question that, that has come up a lot, especially for our choice schools, is for students that live in one community um, but go to school in a different community. And so um, the, the question was about reporting. And so should those be reported to the health district where the school is or where the, where the family lives? So I think that both are going to be important. Um, so the local health director where a school is located will have primary responsibility for working with that school to implement any control measures that are needed and to evaluate um, the situation at hand. Um, but for individuals that are being asked to self-quarantine that reside outside of the jurisdiction, um, we will also need to notify those local health departments as well. Great, um, thank you. Uh, another question going back to now positive cases. And so specifically for asymptomatic positive cases, is it 10 days from the collection date or 10 days from the positive test results? As the CDC says, positive test results. So I'll take this one. <laughs> um, so it is from the date of the spe that the specimen was collected. So when someone does not have uh, have symptoms, uh, we will do contact tracing based on the day the test was taken, and therefore that person needs to be in isolation for ten days since that from there. Great. And when when a positive case um, or when can a positive case return to school, and do they need to be retested? So we would not recommend retesting individuals. Um, we know that individuals can continue to test positive for a prolonged period of time. So we recognize um, that a symptom-based approach is really the best way to determine when somebody can return to school. So if somebody was asymptomatic, they can return 10 days after their specimen was collected. For individuals that have symptoms, they can return 10 days after their symptom onset date, so long as they do not have a fever for 24 hours without using um, fever-reducing medicines such as Tylenol or Advil, and they must also have a general improvement in their other symptoms. So for example, an individual might still be coughing a little bit, um, but should not be coughing as badly as they were um, while they were actively sick. Thanks, Kristen. And that is all outlined um, in addendum five, which is in the chat. Yes. Um, so speaking uh, to students that have COVID symptoms, uh, but have not been tested, um, you know, I think some schools are coming up with different policies around that on how they handle students that haven't been tested yet. Um, are, are schools allowed to request students stay home? even though they don't have a positive res test result. And you know, to this point, I think it's also important if somebody can talk about um, what we've seen as kind of the over uh, concern about um, sickness, whereas meaning you know, somebody might have a, a cold or a flu, but they don't have COVID symptoms. And so this has come up where, where we see some policies getting um, you know, somewhat restrictive you know, in that sense. So I will take this for you, Kristen, as well. So I, folks really need to review Addendum 5 because it really does address three different scenarios 
uh, someone who has symptoms and we've called out about six different symptoms that we think are highest concern for COVID. Um, but people who have symptoms and are not have no known exposure, people who have symptoms and have been exposed to COVID-19 and people who have been in contact with COVID-19 but are not sick. And it outlines what should happen in those in those situations if that person is test positive, test negative, or is not tested. So it's really important to look at that. And there, ha there is a balance in terms of when people have symptoms, but have not had known exposure, um, if they are tested and they test negative, they will be, we are recommending they be allowed back to school uh, after their symptoms have resolved for 24 hours. Um, but if someone doesn't get tested, and um, then we are going to be, we are being conservative and asking them to stay home for 10 days. However, if a provider says that they actually have an alternate diagnosis, so they test them for, for example, strep throat, guess what, they have strep throat, then that could be a situation to allow that student back to school. So it is important that schools review Addendum 5 because we were, the, the intent of that document is to help, pe help schools exactly uh, address these various scenarios. I think the other pe thing that people have to keep in mind is that even if a child has one of these symptoms that we've called out, for example, cough or fever, right now with our current case rates being so low in Connecticut, it is very unlikely that an individual student will have COVID. It is more likely that they will have something else, okay? And so we shouldn't be, uh, I know it's, any symptoms are gonna make people nervous, but we have to kind of keep that in the back of our mind that right now case rates are low. That's why we're actually talking about going back to school. Um, but at the same time, so it is a balance of trying to, to kind of balance that out and making sure that we are, are keeping people as healthy as possible. Thank you, Lynn, for that clarification. Um, I saw something in the questions that maybe highlighted an inconsistency, so I wanted to clarify, and I went back through the slides quickly on Addendum 5. And so we're talking about quarantining for 10 days. Um, it has been said 14 days, I think once or twice on this presentation. And in one of the slides, it does say, 14 and 10. So can we just um, get a, a distinct answer about how long a family or somebody needs to, to quarantine? So there are two different concepts. There's self-isolate, which is what we ask people who have either tested positive or are sick to do. And then there's self-quarantine, which is what we ask somebody who has had an exposure to do. When individuals self-isolate, it is for at least 10 days. And when they self-quarantine, it's for 14 days. Great. Thank you for that clarification, Kristen. Um, and this I just question- want, Just one oh, that yeah, underscores jargon. On the same page, local health and, and, and your education officials, jargon is an issue. Thank you. Uh, this one is specifically about nurses, school nurses. And when, at what point do they, are they considered a contact if they're dealing with a student um, who has tested positive, a student or a staff member that has tested positive? So for school nurses, I believe that, and Kristen Gerard, correct me if I'm wrong, because Lynn has had to go and she's normally my person I bounce these questions off of. Um, but I believe that they would be treated as healthcare workers, even though they're in a school setting. And so they would follow the CDC guidance for healthcare workers. That's what um, I was so if they are wearing a mask, they would be allowed to keep working so long as they do not develop symptoms. They would not have to be excluded as a contact. Um, and the specific details about PPE and the different scenarios um, are fully outlined and that's something that we can distribute um, as part of the minutes after this call um, to people who attended. So I do wanna check in for like a time check. Again, it's, it's 4.06, I wanna be respective of people's time. Um, can, does anybody have to go now or can we plow through, I, I'd say like the last five kind of four, four questions? Good yeah, to we go, can yeah. Okay, great. Um, so, so templates has come up, we've, we've discussed that. Um, you know, actually a lot of these are redundant. So I think what we can do is is address, you know, we, we can scrub through the questions and, you know, if there was anything that seemed like it was unanswered, we can blast that out because we have all the emails of people that registered. Um, so we will make this, you know, to our participants, this will be made available on our SD website, it's recorded. Uh, so any closing remarks from our panelists?
I don't think so. I mean, I think that we covered a lot of information today. Um, we realized that a lot of the work that we do as epidemiologists can be overwhelming to people in the school communities, just as the thought of dealing with educating children is totally overwhelming to us as epidemiologists. <laughs> um, and so again, we really just thank you for your interest in this topic um, and encourage you to really partner with the public health people, um, specifically your local health department, um, because this truly does need to be a partnership to be successful going forward. Um, and we definitely want to help support you um, as schools start to reopen um, at the end of this month and into September. And I just want to end with uh, thanking our panelists and our colleagues from, from uh, DPH and from local health. Russell, thank you. And also Stephanie Knudsen, who is on from our team, and Chris Soto. So thanks, everybody, for participating. We've put a couple, I've put a couple of links in the chat. Um, please continue to go to our website. There's, a, there's considerable information there on the addendums that we sent out and, um, and also the, the transcripts and the recordings for the webinars. And so um, again, we will we will uh, go through the questions and we will we will look, um, provide some of those answers and we'll send them out to the emails for the folks who are on the call. So thanks again, can, everyone. Can, can, I, can I just add one more thing? Because um, sure. we were talking about communications and um, you know my feeling about about notifications to the general public or the school community as necessary. Um, those things have to be balanced against the need to maintain privacy for the individual who is sick and their family. Um, we understand these things are a public interest and there is a public health benefit to disclosing certain information, but uh, we, we really need to be mindful of whenever we're talking about cases, their privacy and, and, and right to confidentiality. So um, when we're sending notifications and for you uh, folks who are working in local schools, work with your local health departments to find the right balance between um, Letting folks know what, what the situation is, if it's important, and not disclosing any you know, identifiable information about people. So well, and then lastly, just just again, I mean, if the, the big takeaway from this conversation is making making sure that you have your local health departments on speed dial. Um, if you serve multiple communities, then make sure that you have the, the contact information for the health director and their staff for those multiple communities, for the RESCs, and for folks who have kids who are attending magnet schools out of town. Um, they should be, you should be talking with them right now and coordinating how you're planning um, for potential changes in your school year and, and class cancellations or, uh, you know, all that should be now. Um, so you're not uh, scrambling to try to find that when, when and if something occurs. So um, I would spend some time doing that and, um, and engage your school nurses and your school medical advisors in that conversation and, and, and assemble that team um, for your planning and your operations going forward. So. Thanks very much and um, have a great afternoon.